up, everybody? Welcome to a very fun and special episode of Omni Bros Live. <laughs> My name is Gabe. I love 90s comics. I love comics in general. But today, along with my cohort, we will be discussing an entire series. What's up, brother? Everybody hello. in the chat, everybody say what's up and hello to Comics Guy. to my boy, Lou. What up, what up, what up? I hope everybody is well. It is the middle of the week, you know? We're almost there, motherfuckers. We're almost It's there. Wednesday, right? Yeah, hump day, new comic book day. Oh, damn right. Wash There's my balls day. Like, That's we're right. ready. We got to make this go. <laughs> There's a lot to be thankful for today, god damn it. Yeah. Back to school this week for anybody whose kids are back to school this week. A lot <laughs> going know. on. I know a lot of parents are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> get them out the house. Get them oh, I know a lot of a lot of teachers are like, oh, gosh, forget this already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've worked in education for quite a while. I'm not in the classroom anymore, but there, there is, for a lot of teachers, they're excited to come back. And you could see the look on their face and stuff like that. You know, oh, new school year, new kids. That usually lasts about two or three weeks. And then they're like, fuck, when does, uh, when does summer break kick in? But the best thing about it is you can tell who the vets are because they've just got this look on their face. They're just like, oh, my God. Another yep. Hear of this, and you can also tell who the new teachers are because they've got that over enthusiastic smile. Like, oh my god, I can't wait! Oh yeah, they haven't had their they haven't had their soul beaten out of them yet by <laughs> screaming kids, stupid teachers, and terrible work curriculum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it time. Give it time. They're like, oh man, I can't wait to buy my own school supplies. This is the best. <laughs> oh man. But yeah, man, it is Wednesday. It's the middle of the week. Uh, today we are talking all about this fucking book. This is, by all accounts, a very special read. But first off, we got some house cleaning to do. Um, house cleaning? I think. That's oh yeah. Uh, and how, uh, we we got some bills to pay. I guess yeah. you know that's yeah. something that something that you can call it as well. But that's with all that said and done, this entire craziness is brought to you. By the one and only InStockTrades.com. That's right. Don't spend, don't pay full mm -hmm. price, full cover price on the collected editions, your omnibuses that are like $125, $150. I'll trade uh -uh. down mine. I'll trade yeah. down mine. Be smart. Make your money work for you a little bit more. Stretch that hard-earned dollar by going to the number one spot for your collected editions, and that's InStockTrades.com. That's right, folks. This is the site that we all support. We've been doing, we've been buying from them since before the show, since before they started sponsoring us. InStockTrades is the number one spot. You can get up to 50% off, sometimes even more, when they're doing like crazy sales and specials and things like that. So always keep your eye on there. Up to 50% off, free shipping on orders of $50 or more. That says a lot. That's that's key. That's fun. That's a major factor in how awesome in stock trades is. Best packaging. Keep that packaging. Keep that box. Keep that saran wrap. Keep all that fun stuff in case you ever need it for moving or for selling. Mm -hmm. You get some extra fun stuff out of there. Every month on the last Monday of the month, we give away a $50 credit to InStockTrades.com as well. Uh, awesome customer service. Fantastic packaging. It's in stock trades. Everybody check them out if you, haven't had, if you haven't been there before. That's right. That's right. Or if you haven't been there in a while or whatever the case is, when it comes down to anything, always hit up in stock trades first. Yeah, yeah. All right. I don't have any mouth harps or anything like that. Like a boy just <laughs> make that a little more interesting. But I mean, yeah, sorry, guys. You want to come up with like a, a jingle or something cool like that, you know? There we go. There's the man of the hour. Unfortunately, right. Jess could not be with us tonight. He's taking care of some stuff. He's feeling under the weather. But uh, we will probably get his thoughts on Scout next Monday, I believe. He'll be back on. So we'll get his full thoughts then. Axel, uh, yeah, InStockTrades does deliver all over the world. Um, 
but shipping and stuff like that, it's going to be a different story. You know, you're not going to get free shipping on $50 orders and stuff like that. So I know uh, Gio, he lives in Puerto Rico. He orders from them and it, it just takes a long time to get his stuff because they do it like on a pallet, but they got to get it to like one hub, put on the pallet, put on the boat. Hopefully it doesn't sink on him again. Stuff like that. <laughs> well, Gio, Gio is, uh, Gio, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what part of Puerto Rico Gio lives in, but Gio is a very strict person with physical things. He refuses for the most part to get digital. He's all physical, even video yeah. games. I'm like, goodness, man, that is, that is something else because I, the only thing that I've left, I'm left with physical is really movies. That's pretty much it. Games, I'm digital. Books, pretty much digital. Movies are the only thing that I'm really physical on at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I still get most things physical. I don't buy a lot of movies because everything sh- pops up on streaming, but there's times where it's like, man, I probably need to buy this and have a physical copy of it. Same with like music. Like I've been listening to some interviews with some like rappers. I'm like, man, I love that album. I should have a physical copy of it. Yeah. Have you gone the vinyl route yet? Uh, here and there. Here and there. Okay. Yeah. I'm not as hardcore into it as Jess or Geo. Mm. You know, I got a few. It's fun stuff. But anyways, uh, let's get started here. Even Lars has started a reread of Scout. Says it's even better than the first time, and reading it the first time was amazing. Okay, let's. So, general thoughts, I guess, before we dive into spoilers, because so for those of you out there that have never read Scout, um, we're gonna spoiler, get spoiler, thoughts. spoiler, 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 yeah. full on spoilers on this today, guys. We're gonna do a full on uh, recap. Now I'm gonna call it a full on recap. We're not gonna go issue by issue, but the whole sixty issue series. We're gonna go from. You know, beginning to end, we're going to be all over the place talking about it. So there will be hardcore spoilers. Right. So general thoughts before we get into spoilers. If you have not read Scalped, I think it's safe to say um, we can both suggest don't let us ruin it for you. Uh, we really, really highly recommend you go read this book. I think that's safe to say for you. That's safe to say for me. This is my third time reading it again. And it has not lost its impact. I have a few nitpicks that I will get into more into the spoiler section. But for the most part, I still stand that I think this is Jason Aaron's best book. I'm not going to disagree. I I, I think above Thor, above his Avengers. Um, I can't think of anything else at the moment off the top of my head. Mm. Um, Southern, Southern Bastards. Bastards, all that stuff. Scalp, scalp is top notch. Yeah, is top notch. I think just in general, like in the crime category, I think it was a uh, Psycho Cleveland that says he thinks it's better than anything that Sean Phillips and Brubaker has done. I agree, and I haven't read enough to say that. But damn, is this right up there with like Hundred Bullets, Powers? Mm-hmm. You know, any other crime book. If you're into crime and you haven't read Scalp, you're you're missing out. Like you will enjoy this, I think, if you like crime books. I have read most of that stuff from Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips because I just I love their writing and that team and the art. And I think because it, it's kind of difficult because the thing is with Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, they haven't done, to the best of my knowledge, a 60 issue continuous run they've had small things like 20 to 30 plus issues i think fates how might be their longest one which is reaching in the 40s if i'm not mistaken but they never did the vertigo 60 issue 70 issue prestige what was expected of you if you had a vertigo title run and the thing is with them they their criminal stuff it's four or five issue arcs, and then they move on to another story. Sometimes it connects, sometimes it doesn't. This is 60 issues. You are with these characters. You learn about these characters. You fall in love with some of these characters, for better or worse. And I think that's what kind of puts it above for me um, over the Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips stuff. Okay. 
I can't hear you, Gabe. You're muted. Uh, yeah, so like Criminal, it's not a full on 60 issue run. It's a bunch of like broken up chapters, you know, mm -hmm. and it doesn't come out on a regular basis or, or anything like that. But man, is this such a hardcore book for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's and fair warning, this is not it's not an easy book to read. I, I, I've made the statement over the past few weeks that I, I firmly believe this wouldn't get published today. I don't think black label as it stands or even i mean it's hard to say because karen berger you know karen berger she she ran vertigo with an iron fist and she had a very fucking good eye for quality of uh, in books and stuff like that but i think something like scalped would it might be toned down it might have been toned down or the editors or an editor might have came in and said look man you got to Maybe cut some of this stuff out. There's some, there's some really, really dark moments in this book. I mean, it, and and the thing is, it doesn't shy away from subject matters such as um, abortion, uh, drug use, heavy, heavy drug use, heavy alcoholism, heavy um, alcoholism, um, gambling, I, murder, double yeah, cross, yep, um, yep, yep, triple cross sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what sex, religion, uh, right. uh, being, being, yeah, you know, it puts the American Indian culture right on front street, mm -hmm. but it comes down to how their reservations are structured, how they, how piss poor these reservations, or at least, well, at least this one here with the Rose Prairie, how it's, I mean, it's like one of the worst ghettos, like in America are like reservations, and, and in a way, it's it's very it's very sad um, because you do hear kind of stories and things like that. Now you have seen the TV show Res Dogs, right? Is that yeah. kind of similar to what? Because I only watched the first episode; it didn't really grab me. I need to go back and watch it. Is that kind of in the same vein of this, or is it more comedic? It's 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 teenagers, and it's way toned down. It's okay. definitely like like kind of what you were describing. How they might have they might tone it down is probably what Res Dogs. We would get res dogs dogs out of it. Okay. Okay. You know. All right. Because so, this is like full on like smoking crack, making meth. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. Almost comedically so. Like, yeah. It's. I mean, multiple abortions. Yeah. Um. That's tough. That's the murder, tough. crime, conspiracy, racketeering. Uh. I mean, it's it's it runs the full gamut, but res or res dogs is like kids that steal like a chip truck mm. and stuff like that and the oh, first okay. season's good and then I, I fell off of it like real fast after the second after the first season ended right okay so just the ballpark pitch so scout basically centers around it, the uh -huh. character named dashel bad horse dashel bad horse grew up on this reservation named prairie rose and he eventually left it uh we're being super vague right now and we'll get into more of that stuff later but he comes back and he wants to work for the owner of the – for the head of the reservation – not an owner. The head of the re reservation named Lincoln Red Crow. And along the way, he gets enveloped in some really shady shit. Now, there is a bit of a twist to this. And it's revealed in the first issue. Again, if you've not read it, I'm not going to ruin that for you in this section. And it's one of those first issues that just – if you don't, if you're not in by the first issue, the book's not for you. It just really isn't, honestly. Because there's a huge reveal that really recontextualizes why he's there and the reason for him being back to where he grew up in the first place. Can we say, can we say that? That's fair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's... It's 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 an onion. There's so many layers. Like there's slow reveals on everything, and the big reveal in the first issue just sets the tone for the rest of the series. Because the rest of the series is like, oh shit, when's the next? You know, when's the other shoe going to drop? Like, when right. is this information going to be, you know, revealed to everybody else? Or you know, when's this is going? When is this going to? When is this going to catch up to Dash? Kind yeah. of thing, right? Because 
this entire series, now I've said it before in other shows, if you've seen Uncut Gems, it's very much like Uncut Gems in terms of how claustrophobic it feels, how over the shoulder it feels like reading it. Like it's like, what's going to happen next? Oh shit. Like this person found this out. What's going on here? You know, things of that sort. There's not a single likable character in the entire series. They are all nasty criminals of some sort where it's like, sure. I like, I like Dash. He's the main character, but it's, you know, he, he, he's an abusive cop, you know, you know, drug addict, um, you know, everything else that he's got going on with him. Same well, no, with all the other main characters. There, there is, I would say, Officer Falls Down is probably the one character in here that is on the straight and narrow, and he's probably yeah. But you don't want to like a cop, like that's that's bullshit. <laughs> hmm. No way, dude. It, he's probably the one straight and narrow character in this book. So, with that said, let's go ahead and start diving more into spoilers, so we could talk more freely about this book. Right. Um. So uh, the first main character really is Dash. Absolutely. Okay, it's Dash who left the reservation, joined the military, had a long stint in military, going to war. I mean, he was like a street fighter, like a cage fighter. Yeah, he was just he just lived a life of violence, and then and he comes back. Up, they set him up at the very beginning of the story like this dude is a fucking badass, and right yeah. from the beginning. He is a badass. Like they just a badass Indian with nunchucks just fucking people up. <laughs> they justify it and they set him up really well. Now, the big reveal that we can talk about at the end of the first issue is that Dashel Bad Horse is an undercover FBI agent who has been sent in by Agent Nitz. And Agent Nitz is just one of the most fucking horrible, despicable FBI agents that you will probably ever read in comic book fiction. But the thing is with all the characters in this story, they are all fleshed out enough that you get why Agent mm-hmm. Nitz is the way he is. You get why Dash or Bad Horse is the way that he is and what why he's doing what it is. And what I love about this is that there are no, there are no shallow characters here. So Dash is brought in. He goes undercover to work under Chief Red Crow's reser- uh, reservation, who is just about to open up this grand new, uh, this brand new casino, who he is hoping that will bring new life to Prairie Rose Reservation because Prairie Rose is. For all intents and purposes, it's horrible. <laughs> I would right. not want to live here <laughs> at all. And that's and, that's a thing that they even talk about in in the in the series a lot. Is there's that one single issue where that kind of like master disguise guy kind of shows up right on the bus? Yeah, and he's talking to people. He's like, "Why do you insist on staying in this pile of shit you call a reservation?" You do realize that the government set this here to separate your culture mm-hmm. and to destroy it from within and let you guys kind of kill each other. And there's no hope. It's they 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 have like an average income of like what like five thousand dollars a Pathetic. year? Really something small. like something just really sad like that. Yeah, yeah. But yet the income for alcohol is like $3 million. Like all that money that they spend apparently goes to alcohol and beer and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so it, there, there is like, again, it's, it's the worst kind of ghettos. You have no future. You have no way of getting off. There's no jobs. Yeah. It's literally just people who living off of, um, they even say it like government cheese sandwiches, government handout that, that, that they get. And they just kind of end up just being, able to adapt to like this this lifestyle and they just end up staying around. So it's just really an odd situation. Like why do you stay? They want you to die. You know, there's such a, you know, your your entire race of people have basically been annihilated. Why do you want to stay? I mean most people do leave. Like there's a small population on the on these reservations. Most mm-hmm. people leave. But the ones that stay, they have their reasons of like 
you know, this is our culture. This is this is our land. You know, we're not going to let people drive us away. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the longer you stay, the worse you're going to end up. Right. Yeah. And we end up seeing some of that towards the end of the story that we'll get to a little bit later. Yep. Um, so that's what Battle of the Horse he's brought in. He He's basically tasked with by Agent Nitz, I want you to get me anything on this guy. I want to bring this motherfucker down. I want to bring not down anything. Him. It's specifically it has to be something hardcore, a murder, basically murder. It's a murder, and it has to be. You have to get me a murder, something serious. I need to pin something on this guy. We find out this is not the first time that Agent Nitz has had some experience with Red Crow. The thing with this book is that it jumps around in time quite a bit. And I know mm -hmm. this was one of the things that you really didn't care for when we started our, our reread early on. Right. It, it, it jumps around a lot in time. But it'll say something like, you know, 35 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. a year ago, six months ago, a week ago, an hour ago. Like it does that. Um, and then also, and that, that's fine and all, but something that kind of messed me up where it was like, it'll tell you something that you didn't see on, on the page. And you're like, when did this happen? Yeah. And then later they'll explain it like in, in like a couple issues later kind of thing. So that was, it's, it's, almost, you have to almost read it in like, like all together. Like, you, you know, I, I, I read this in singles. I didn't read the, you know, I didn't start until maybe like. 12 issues into it or something like that in singles. And I'm glad I did it because it's so hard to keep track. If you were yeah. to read this in singles and the way they're explaining things to you and it doesn't be revealed until like a couple issues later, it'd be so hard to kind of keep up with it. Right. You know? Right. And I think it does read much better in collected editions because there is a lot of flashing back, flashing forward. I um, catch myself a lot like going like reading and then going like, wait, wait, wait a second. I had to like kind of yeah. like go back a few times and be like, oh, okay. It, it reads better collected, I think. And yeah. so we get a flashback sequence that in the 19, I want to say 70s, Agent Nitz was back on the reservation, and you have all these characters. There's Catcher, who we get into a little bit later. There's Red Crow. There's Dash's mother, Gina Badhorse. Mm -hmm. And I think there was another character who he ends up in prison. And basically – these characters have cornered two FBI agents that are close to Agent Nitz, and one of them kills them. And that and scalps called, them. And scalps them. And that sets off the chain of events that lead to current day where Dashiell Badhorse has come back to the reservation. His relationship with his mother is not great. It's terrible. And this hasn't is, seen his mother in like 20 years or something like that. 15 something years like that. or something. Yeah. And, and this is Agent Nitz's plan to get revenge on not only Gina Badhorse, uh, but also on Red Crow, is that he's going to use Dash to bring down the whole organization. What I love about Red By Red any means necessary. Any like, fucking he means. is like, Go I don't ahead. care. You can go ahead and get hooked on drugs all you want. Yeah. Like, what? It does, I don't care if you burn, as long as Red Crow is somehow held accountable for these murders that he knows he did he knows yeah he was part of it red crow killed these these fbi agents that were his friend well he thinks red crow was the one that did it well, that, well i was gonna get to that later but he yeah. swears this entire time and they make you believe it like they, yeah. the way they kind of show it and they show like how red crow was during that time yeah yeah you probably killed him that guy's a motherfucker mm -hmm. sure but here's the thing what i love about red crow is i truly believe his intentions are good because what he wants to do is he really does want to open up that casino to bring life back to the reservation and to to kind of get it out of the fucking slump that it's in uh, and and bring in finances and bring in tourists and bring in people the problem is he's doing it with drug money he's doing it with Deals with certain other mob bosses and things like that. The Hamung. <laughs> the Hamung. <laughs> so it's a house basically just of cards. And eventually you you start seeing those cards fall apart. Yeah, Red Crow thinks he's in charge. And he tries to hold on to that as much as possible. But he has like um, the tribal community. You know, like the, not the tribal community. The tribal um, 
like the tribal government that he's a, that he's ahead of mm-hmm. that's telling him not to do this. Yeah. Um, he has a bunch of like just dirty rat bastard like Texas oil millionaires who are helping them fund this. That's telling them what to do. Right. The Hamong uh, like basically owns this casino. Like it was all started up by them, you know, yeah. and their money. So he's doing it, but it's it's a situation that he doesn't have full control of, even though you think that the entire time. Right. Right. Um. I so we got we got we got we got Red Crow, we got Gina, we got Dash Holt, Dash. We're missing Carol. I Carol. love Carol. Um. Mostly because I love the arc that Carol goes through throughout the book. So Carol in this book is Red Crow's daughter. daughter. Yeah. And she has pretty much denounced all relationship with her father. She hates her father. But her and Dash had a thing when they were kids. Here's Carol. And Carol, <laughs> Carol, for all intents and purposes, well, she is the town... Lady of the Night, I think. Door, doorknob, doorknob, bicycle. Yeah, she's got she's got more issues than Sports Illustrated. Um, mainly relationships with mainly relationship issues with her father, and how she's been abused, and she's a drug addict, and all this other stuff. She is not painted in a really great light at the beginning of this story, but she also has, I think, one of the best character arcs throughout the book. The big. So the, the big moment, I think, at the end of the first volume, and, and we could say this, is that Gina Badhorse is going and she's fighting against Red Crow and she's basically saying, this isn't fair. You know, you've got this person locked up. You should not be locked up. I'm going to go talk to the person that really is responsible for the murders, who it turns out is this guy named Catcher. The big reveal of the end of the first volume is Gina Badhorse is dead. And I remember reading this the first time going... Oh, yeah, she gets murdered. She gets murdered. Yeah. And, you know, very, and the thing is, they don't shy. It's a very, you don't see the murder, but you see the after of it. And it's mm-hmm. very gruesome. It is very tough to, to see. Um, and it's, it's a thing that also, again, this is all. What, so one of the things that I've talked about is that if you, if you get a chance, there's a great friggin' lecture by Matt Parker and Trey Stone, the guys who uh, the guys who South do Park. South Park, and I'm I'm gonna wrap I'm gonna come back around to this, but I promise. One of the things they say is that great storytelling is because this happens, then this happens, and then because that happens, then this happens, and this mm-hmm. is a great fucking book that's an example of that, where it's a dom everything that happens here is a domino effect that leads into something else. Yeah. It's a it's a perfect three three story or three arc structure. Absolutely, hundred percent. And with the death of Gina Badhorse, it kind of sets off all these characters going. Well, we got to find out who the fuck it was that killed Gina Badhorse because one Red Crow at one point was in love with her at a very when they were both young. It's Dash's it's Dash's mom, so that's another thing. And on top of that, Nitz has a past with her as well. So, I I fucking love this book, man. <laughs> like we've kind of set up the general gist of it. I fucking love this book. I, I really do. Um, my favorite arc would probably be the situation involving the monk, the Hamungs that happened mm-hmm. around the mid midway point of the book. And in in this instant, what ends up happening is that Red Crow has pretty much said to the Hmong. The Hmongs have sent in their guy, Agent Brass, who is just this small dude. He's missing an arm. It's almost comical. And he is just a sick motherfucker. He keeps killing people on Red Crow's reservation. And Red Crow is fucking tired of it after a certain point. And he's just killing them in terms of just for fun. Like he's yeah. getting like underage, like was it like an underage boy and like some hookers and stuff like that or whatever. And was just just torture him to death for just yeah. fun and pleasure. And Red Crow doesn't want to do anything about it because the Hmongs are the ones that are funding most of the money in his casino. Um, and they, they sent him over because they felt that Red Crow is losing control of the reservation because the drugs are getting worse. The cops yeah. are coming in. FBI is now on. 
There's rumors that there's um, some people that, that have infiltrated his inner circle that's working for him that might be like a Fed. Like, so they lost all confidence in Red Crow and was like, all right, well, we're going to put you guys in place by sending in just this monster torturer. Right. Red Crow eventually just has en enough of their shit. He's just like, uh, and it could, but the thing is, it could not happen at a worse time because what ends up happening is that Gina Badhorse has her, she had her ashes placed inside this little bag by this old lady named Poor Bear. Poor Bear is basically the grandmother of the entire reservation. A lot of people come to her if they can't handle their kids or if they want to get sober and clean and they stay with her. She is one of my favorite characters in this book. Mm -hmm. I love her character. And basically she gives him this little bag with Gina's ashes and says, if you cannot commit a crime, if you stay clean for a single year, her spirit will be able to walk freely in the afterlife. However, if you do fuck up and if you commit crimes and, you know, do really bad shit, her spirit will be damned. And I think what Red Crow lasts maybe a week. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah. He tries. He tries his hardest, but the Hmong are there and they're fucking things up. And then eventually he's like, oh, fuck. He, he even apologizes. He's like, I'm so sorry, Gina. In an amazing shootout sequence where he basically goes to their base and he lights them up. Well, here's the best part, though. So, Agent Brass comes into town to try and, like, put Red Crow in his place by, you know, doing whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. Red Crow's not having that because he's, like... You know, prostituting little boys and like yeah. killing people and stuff like that. So he snaps, throws him in prison in his own jail, then kills him while the Hamung is on the phone giving him shit. He's like, "All That's right, well, listen moment. to this," and blows Doc and 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 blows Brass away That's in front of moment. everybody, like in front of the, a, a jail full of people. Okay, um, so the Hamung drive down. To confront Red Crow about this, mm -hmm. Red Crow lets them beat his ass. Like they they just wreck him in front of mm -hmm. everybody. And as they're driving home, Red Crow goes, "All right," gets his helicopter, <laughs> flies back to <laughs> with Minneapolis. Shunka. Where yeah, but Shunka, who we haven't mentioned yet, yeah. Shunka is like his right hand. Uh, Red Crow's like right hand man, like. Uh, um, built like a brick shit house. He is intelligent yeah. as fuck. This is this massive, crazy Indian guy who is just like his, like, kind of like chauffeur, right hand man, bitch boy, all that kind of stuff, right? So they take a helicopter and they fly back to the Hamang headquarters and beats them there because they're driving. They helicopter over there mm -hmm. and just blows everybody away and waits for them to show back up and then blows them away. Yeah, and there's a reason behind that. He said, I didn't want to make the reservation of basically just a fucking war zone. So right. I I brought it to them. Yeah, um, they can kick my ass all they want here. That's fine. I'm not going to cause you know any more trouble or war or death at the reservation. Let's get them when they get back home. <laughs> Let's just beat them there and just blow them apart. Now, you mentioned Shunka. What are your thoughts? I love Shunka. I think he's the top three character in the series for me. He's definitely one of the best characters because he is a troubled, troubled person. Yeah. And is just the biggest badass. Like he takes no shit. He fucks everybody up. He gets done what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, you think he's loyal to Red Crow, but stuff goes on a little bit later. Yeah. And then he also has one of the best story arcs. He does. Where he does. there's like three issues, it's three, not four long. issues, maybe. Yeah, it's it's pretty no. short. Where you get a full on Shunka story that just tells you everything you need to know about him, including the fact that he's a closeted gay guy. Yeah. Who just hates himself for being gay and hates other gays. Um, but just goes to this other reservation to take care of business and falls in love with the guy he's supposed to kill. Yeah. I don't know if fall in love is the right word. Falls in lust, whatever. Like they hook up and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. That that's just a great story arc. That's one of the best story arcs because it's a it's a, it's a double cross. 
it's a bunch of trickery. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of like uh, homophobic stuff in there that comes to fruition later when Shanka goes and just kills everybody and the curb stomps them in the swimming pool. It's such a great moment, though. That's one of the best moments in Scalp is that curb stomp. Yeah. Yeah. So this is pretty late on in the book. There's a lot of stuff that's happened at this point, but the general gist of it is that Red Crow has sent Shunka out to handle a situation in a, in a different city. And when he gets there, he finds out that this guy who happens to be gay as well, he's like, look, these people are trying to kill me. You know, it's absolutely nuts. Oh my he's God. the current like president. Oh no, he's the former president of the tribal community at this other reservation. Something like that, right. And the next morning, Shunka goes back there. And he's like, yeah, whatever. He doesn't really think twice about it too much. And the guy's dead. And this kind of sets off Shunka to go, fuck. So Shunka goes and he kills all these people that have tried, that have basically murdered this guy that he fell in lust with, I think is yeah. the word we could say. Yeah. Three days later, or a few days later, pass by, and Shunka looks at the body of the guy that was supposedly dead, but it's not him. Turns out, Shunka was played. And it turns out he was played because this guy, it, this this was a moment that, this is one of those reveals where I completely forgot about it because it's been so long. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot about this, this twist where the guy is actually still alive. And he's like, hey, you did it. You did it for me. Thank Thanks you. for helping me win my election back or whatever. Like, get the fuck out of get the fuck out of here, basically. And <laughs> yeah. it's this little four or five issue arc that you get so much from the character that I really appreciate because I do love the character of Shanka. You figure you find out one, he's gay. You find out he had a really tough upbringing because of the fact that he was gay. You don't get too much of that, but I really I mentioned that if Jason Aaron would ever come back to this, I would absolutely love him to explore maybe Shunka's past a little bit, give us a 10-issue arc or something like that, or he'll go the Better Call Saul route and we get a full-on story of how his upbringing was. Um, so, But I, I love that four or five-issue mini arc that we get just with that character alone. Here's a okay. catcher. Here's yeah, a catcher. That's I just love the greedy art in this book. Like it absolutely fits like the story. Arm Gurera. Yeah, know? Arm Gurera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. here's a bastard we haven't talked about yet, Lou. Diesel. Oh my god. <laughs> Which is where my my little thing came from, the one sixteenth Kickapoo. Right. So, because <laughs> we're jumping around a lot, there's so much that happens in this book. It, it, we're jumping around a lot. There's this character named Diesel who is 116th Kickapoo. And he looks like just this regular white guy. That you yeah, he, he's, he's that guy that we all knew in school who wanted to be like black or wanted to be Hispanic or wanted yeah. to be whatever, you know? Yeah, he's 116th Kickapoo. And he, and he, and he hates that because yeah. he was denied uh, basically – quote unquote like citizenship into the tribal community mm -hmm. so he doesn't get like any benefits you know of that they get for being indians from the government or, or whatever the case might be or yeah. um what it was is the benefits from this other reservation where he grew up they had a casino and the entire tribe profited from that like people got paid like the entire community got paid mm -hmm. from the casino and he him and his family were excommunicated from that because he didn't have enough Indian blood in him. Yeah. Yeah. Diesel is, is one of the worst in the list of horrible characters in this book, not horribly written or anything, but just terrible human beings. Diesel is probably up there on the list. He's, yeah. he's fucking terrible as a person. He and kills. He, there is a moment where he ends up killing this kid's mom Dashiell befriends him and Dashiell kind of takes him under his wing because Dashiell just found out his mom died so he's like fuck well, this kid's going through some traumatic shit his mom just died Diesel killed her um, let me kind of befriend him the, he gives the kid a gun to kind of shoot show him how no. to shoot and everything like that he doesn't give oh, him yeah, he gives him how to shoot but he gives him like uh, a bunch of arrowheads right he gives him a bunch of arrowheads he teaches this kid to shoot 
And the kid just goes and tries to kill Diesel because he killed his mom. And Diesel and, 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 and Dash wasn't wouldn't do it. Like Dash is like, I can't kill him, like, I can't go after him. Like we have to figure it out because yeah. Diesel dun, is dun, and, uh, Diesel reveal. is another FBI agent that is working for NITS as well. Yeah. Piece of shit. So this little kid who gets the you know, Dash teaches him how to shoot. Uh, gives him like a bunch of stuff. Like here's like my Arrowhead collection because he's since his mom died, his mom was a cracked out yeah, prostitute she was whore, yeah, who was killed in a crack house, was strangled to death during sex, and the kids are in the next room in this like crack house. So that's kind of sets up this whole again terrible living situation that these people go through on this reservation, uh, <coughs> and he takes those arrowheads and trades it for a gun. And then goes after Diesel himself. But Diesel gets the draw on him and yeah. kills the kid. Unfortunately. And and Dash can't do anything. Even after he kills the kid, Nitz is like, you can't touch him. Can't touch him. We'll right. handle it. He's our agent. Yeah. We will handle it. Now, Diesel does eventually get arrested by this Texas Ranger in another town who... This guy's a fucking joke. He basically is like telling his deputies and stuff like that. Oh, I was in Vietnam. Yeah, I'm this big badass and everything like that. The motherfucker was never in Vietnam. That's revealed later on. He's just fucking lying and he's 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 terrible. Um, kind of to close out that arc though, because it does lead into the very end of the story. Eventually, Dash goes up to Diesel, who is now locked up, and he tells him, "We need to work together." We need to figure this out. Let's bring down Red Crow together. I'm going to get you out of this jail. Um, Diesel gets out, and he meets up with Dash. They head over into, like, the mountainous area. And in one of the most satisfying moments, Dash shoots the shit out of Diesel. He pops him in the knee. He pops him in the other knee. Then he pops him in the arm, and he it goes into like really explicit detail of everything that Dash does. It doesn't show you too much, but he's he basically tortures the shit out of him for killing that kid's mom. He reloads that he has like extra clips, like he reloads a few times. He yeah. shoots him so much. Yeah. Um now this moment is actually really crucial because at first read, you probably won't think it is, but this actually leads in to the very ending of the book. <clears throat> Granted. At this time, though, Dash has kind of met up with Carol again. He's developed a bit of a drug problem. What did you say, Gabe? Oh, yeah. There's plenty of drugs and stuff in this book. Uh, Yeah, Carol gets him hooked on heroin. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're they're both characters that are very broken and in a very dark place. You know, Dash has just lost his his mom. He's brought back and he's under a lot of pressure. He, you know, he thinks that they're going to fucking, the Red Crow is going to find out he's an FBI agent. So he finds solace in Carol and he ends up getting hooked on heroin. He ends up getting hooked on the junk. And we also end up getting Carol's backstory and we find out why Carol is the way that she is. She was pregnant at a certain point in the past. And she was pregnant with this guy who she, he Worked for Red Crow, if I'm not mistaken, or I'm assuming. I, I'm assuming because he ends up stealing like a like a couple kilos of drugs from Red Crow. Right, and so in his in his attempt to get away, him and Carol they get inside this car, and Red Crow's goons follow him and end up shooting up the car, which causes her to lose her child, and he ends up dying as well. Yeah, he gets killed. She basically almost gets killed. The baby right. doesn't make it through. Like it's a nasty shootout. It's pretty and bad. And that is that point of her life where she just became a hollow person. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tra- she's one of the more tragic characters in the story, but it, it also leads into what I said, one of my favorite arcs in the book. Um <clears throat> and you know, through certain circumstances and th- certain things here and there, they eventually do get clean, but it's a it's a while. What is it, 10, 12 issues where it's like there's even a point where Dash isn't even in the book that much, and he's supposed to be the main character. What well, is that point where, like, yeah, because he he gets shot in the mouth, 
and his wall and his wall and his jaw is wired. That's towards the end. That's yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, actually we're we're at, there's so many characters in this book. We're forgetting one crucial character, actually, Dino. Oh little Dino, yeah. Dino, Dino, uh Dino, Dino Poor Bear. Poor Bear. Okay. So Dino Poor Bear. Dino Poor Bear is a character. He's a kid that lives on the reservation and he is trying his best to fix his car because he wants to get off the fucking reservation. He's like, I'm going to take my daughter who I had with this girl who was like 16. He was 16 at the time and stuff like that. And I'm going to get them the fuck out of this reservation. I just need to fix my car. So he's working at, at Red Crow's um, he's working at Red Casino. Crow's Casino. And he gets enough money to fix the car eventually because Red Crow is actually kind to him. And he says, "Get take the money, get the fuck out of here. You know, but if you leave, don't ever fucking come back. He fixes his car, but he doesn't leave. And that to me is one of those things where it's like, you had it. You had your chance. Well, well he gets the money. And the first thing he does is he just goes party with it. Yeah. He does fix the car eventually, though. Yeah. He does fixes fix the car. car. Um there's one of my favorite parts is that he himself, because Gina moves in, not Gina, uh, Carol. Carol, does Carol moves in because she's going through like drug withdrawals and all this crazy stuff going on. And Granny offers to take care of her. Mm-hmm. And because she's, she's at this point, big spoiler, she's pregnant with Dash's kid. Right. And she's hooked on heroin. So Granny says, You can't go cold turkey or you're going to lose the baby. Yeah. So you have to get uh, instead, methadone. you know, go through methadone. The baby's gonna be born addicted, but that can be taken care of later. And in the meantime, you can go through, stay here with me, live with me. We'll take care of you. We'll take care of the situation. We'll get the baby put together and brought in, and get them get it taken care of as we cross that bridge. And while they're living there, Dino falls in love with her. Yeah. Because Carol's hot. She has big old boobs and tattoos on them and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. To the point that he wants to, like, he's, like, really falling head over, head over heels with her, like. Yes, he is. He thinks that they're falling, that she loves him because she just kind of calls him, like, you know, like, my, like, I owe everything to you. I'm so glad you're in my life. And he takes that as, like, you know, as something serious. So this is one of the best parts. On the reservation, they're talking about that this little girl, I think her name was like Stephanie Two Trees, mm-hmm. was killed in a hit and hit and run. Yeah. And Dino finds out that it's like his friends that did his it. Boys. Or some people that he knew, right? Yeah. So he turns them in for the reward money. He takes that reward money to buy some diamond earrings to give it to Carol. Oh my God. <laughs> Which you see where, okay. In the, chat, <laughs> in the chat, and you know. Um, if you're listening to this on the playback, we've all had the friend where you're just sitting there going, "This isn't gonna work, man." Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, you don't fall in love with the with the stripper at the club. You know? <laughs> like this is uh, this is not gonna work the way you think it is, pal. So he ends up buying the earrings. He ends up giving them. You know, he didn't even give them to her. He doesn't give them to him because right when that's about to happen, she goes, "You're like a brother to me." Oh, and and she basically drops. I really should call Dash. I need to talk to him. I need to straighten things out. He's just fucking pissed. Oh my god! I love the model. I love the dialogue in the in the beginning of that issue because it. Uh, Here's some Carol. Yeah, I love the dialogue in the beginning of that issue because it it foreshadows what Dino's future is going to be. Yeah, and it's really fucking tragic. I mean, for that, he's like running um, uh, Sudafed for for these like meth meth uh, meth makers and stuff. From white so he's market. going like store to store, like delivering like Sudafed and buying Sudafed and stuff like that. So he's doing some like drug running for money as well. Yeah, and then those are the people he turns in for the reward money. <laughs> that he uses to buy the earrings, and she one hundred percent just bro zones him. It's pretty bad. It, it, it's yeah. actually really bad. Um, heading in towards the finale, so I, I think we've kind of set this up enough. How a bit. Do, There's a lot to this series. Like we're we're we're, we're, we're scratching this. Around. We're jumping around because there's there's so much that happens. How do you feel about the ending? I think the ending was satisfying. 
Okay. It ends like the absolute final ending ends on the idea of like there, you know, there could be more. Like, you know, people kind of ride off into the sunset, more or less, to use a cowboy term for an Indian story. Oh, um man. but the ending goes down where oh my god, when that when that other shoe finally drops, yeah, and Dash reveals to Red Crow, I'm arresting you, I'm a federal agent, go fuck yourself. Yeah, he finally does it. Oh my god, it just it's like oh when it just because you knew it was gonna happen, it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And Dash has like bad stuff on him because he's 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 addicted to drugs and he killed Diesel and all this other stuff, but he's able to find some other more evidence of Red Crow murdering somebody. Right. And just reveals, hey, this is who you know, this is it. I'm a I'm an FBI agent, you're going down, and then you start to see like the domino effect kind of take place after that. Because even right before that happens, Red Crow decides to kind of go clean. Like he's like, yeah. fuck the Hamung. I love that moment. I call them meth dealers. Like he starts burning all the meth houses on the reservation. That like he decides, I forgot what it was that triggered it. Something triggered it where he's like, that's it. I'm done. I need to handle my reservation the right way. His own taking meth away drugs. His own meth houses, his own guys. He's putting his own guys in jail, basically. And yeah, he's running everybody out. He's, he's it, all, it, all the people that that made him who he is, basically, with all the drug money and stuff like that, burning it down. He's cleaning up the res as much as he can. He doesn't have much friends anymore or much like loyal loyalists because he just turned them all in and you know drove them away and stuff like that. And then Dash, at this point, Dash is basically like Red Crow's treating him like a son. Like they go through like um, the spiritual journeys in like a sweat TP, and I don't know if it was ayahuasca or something where they were like, "Here is who we are now. We're completely cleansed. Let's reveal our secrets." You know, so they really Red Crow really entrusts them at that point, and then bam, hey FBI, you're arrested, you're in trouble. That's it. Really and you good. see the domino effect. The casino closes down. The reservation kind of gets a little bit worse. Yeah. Because of it. Um, but at the same time, a new group of people become like the tribal leaders. Yeah. And they are the like, more traditionalists who are like, we need to do it this way and keep it to our, our culture and our, our standards that we've always been through. With no this. drugs, no killing. Yep. So we need to make this like a, a, a nice place to live as opposed to just being a shithole to benefit yourself. Mm hmm yeah 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 and this is towards the ending and there's still one thing that is not dealt with is that catcher who has set off all the events in the 1970s has not been dealt with he was the one that killed gina he was the one that killed the two fbi agents all that the guy's stuff. a ghost in the book like he just kind of strolls around in the woods on like a horse and just appears and he needs to like cause trouble right he pops in and out of the story frequently yeah eventually he he gets what's coming to him, and actually a really satisfying moment. I, I really love love that moment. Um. <clears throat> but then at the end, as everything kind of winds down, Dash needs Dash is going to go like you know he has some legal troubles to deal with. Um, he falls in love with a one of the new tribal members. Uh, they create a community center. In the name of Gina, because Dash like donates all kinds of money to the tribe, and in, in turn they, they make a community center to honor his mother. Uh, and basically that's some, that's almost the end of it, right? He just kind of just that's hitchhikes out of out of the res and, and goes his own way. Well, Red Crow is just stranded. He just he's living off the land, like well, he just kind of like lives in a teepee. Well, you think. It's all. It's going to be a happy ending because Dash is now staying with this this woman that lives, that is basically the been the new head of the reservation and everything that she's got to do. Um, but it doesn't turn out that way. It doesn't turn out as a happy ending as you would because it ends up that they find the gun that Dash used to kill Diesel, and because of that, Red Crow basically gets let out of jail. Because they can't stick it on him because Dash killed some Dash killed another FBI agent. So because of that, the charges don't stick on Red Crow and he's let out of jail, which leads into this huge, huge firefight 
at the casino that ends up with the casino oh being burned God. down. Yep. The casino ends up being burned down. Nitz, is, Nitz gets involved in the fight. He ends up dying. Basically, all these characters end up dying in this casino. It's it's a moment where you don't know who's going to survive and who's going to die, and it's great. Yeah. Unfortunately, you do lose some of your favorite characters in that moment because Shunka ends up dying in that moment where Shunka ends up fighting uh, Bad Horse, and Shunka almost kills him, but Red Crow pulls a bullet in his head. Yep. And then that's that's the one that's the thing that that bad horse that Dash uses like okay I'm arresting you now I you, I saw you commit murder like this is it this is it I'm done I'm ready to get off this reservation yeah but if the officer falls down who's like hey we found the gun we it has your prints on it Best I'm gonna I give you the heads it. up yeah. and then that's when Dash disappears that's when he like you know hicks, hitchhikes out of there. Yeah, Officer Falls Down, who is probably the most cleanest cop on the reservation. He's pretty straightforward. He ends up telling Dash, look, the best I could give you is a little bit of time. I could I could say yeah. you weren't here, and then it's it's over, man. You got to go. So basically, Dash ends up on the run at the end of this book. He leaves, and he's on the run. And uh, Carol, who has like, the best arc, probably yeah. like, the only real arc, you see that uh, Granny... Uh, granny poor bear has died right and she is now the new granny basically of the reservation who's right. helping people with their kids who are getting addicted um she you know somebody comes up to me and says, my, my kid's on drugs i don't know what to do about it and she's like well go through his trash bring me his trash i could tell you what he's doing right and we can go from there get him off so she becomes like this like surrogate like mother to to the reservation as granny was like granny taught her Passed down that knowledge and that, you know, medicine or whatever down to her to continue that kind of a tradition. It's an arc that makes sense. It totally mm -hmm. makes sense. And it's a great transformative moment for the character. And and it, it basically goes into this. Everything she went through was basically for a reason. And now yeah. you can see in certain ways, like in most drug filled areas and most areas filled with crime, the cycle never really ends. It just kind of repeats itself in certain ways because we end up finding out that Dino is basically now starting to become this head of this local drug cartel. Yeah. Yeah, he becomes like this badass, you yeah. know? He basically... Starts I mean, he's been through a lot. Like, Brass pulled out his eye and he's gone through all kinds of stuff. So you, you, you see where that comes from with him, you know? Yeah. He ends up becoming basically the head of this local drug cartel. Yep. Yeah, like you said, that's just those types of communities. That's those areas, you know. So the cycle really never like I, I love the ending of this book. I think it's great. The, the only the only real nitpick that I have of the book is that I think certain moments are a bit more clunky in how they play out. And it feels more like, oh, okay, that maybe could have been a bit better written or laid out this in particular there's one specific moment where agent nitz is basically disgraced he's like oh my god you know the fbi want nothing to do with him and everything like that and he just happens to stumble upon a terrorist organization on the reservation uh -huh. uh, after a drunken night and he ends up killing them all it, it's a moment where i went okay i guess because you got to you know, that leads into him basically getting the entirety of the FBI back on his side in order to take down Rick. I get it. It's just a bit clunky for my taste. It's like it, okay. it, it didn't work for me all that well. Other than like that weird kind of like time jumpy stuff, not the time jumpy stuff, but where it's like, hey, hey, you know, Dashiell got or uh, Diesel escaped. And like, when did Diesel escape? Like, that didn't happen. And then yeah. later on, like one or two issues later, they explain it. They do that a lot. And I'm like, oh, that's just that was like my only real nitpick where I'm like, did I miss something? Like, because you know, I didn't read it all in one sitting. I read it over a couple of weeks. Usually I read a lot on the weekends. I'm like, did I miss this? Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Like, was I real high when I read this? Like, what let me go back a little bit? You know, I'm like, oh, they explain it later. That's really it. Outside of that, like some of the art's a little dark, eh, you know, whatever, no big deal. Like, but other than that, like the art's fantastic throughout the series. It's all covered done by Jock. It's it's such a good it's it's fantastic all the way through. 
all the way through. I love Aram Gouret as art. I think yeah. I think he was the perfect fit for this. Honestly, these guys never even been on a reservation, right? As far as we know. Well, I mean, yeah. From uh, I read, I was reading some interviews with Jason Aaron where he was like, "Yeah, he just read a bunch of books," you know. Yeah. So we got some yeah, questions. Aram in the comments is great. Stuff. Yeah. I it, it's, it. it's five. It's five hardcovers. Um, there's um, trade paperbacks of these out there as well. Are these but I think print? they're all. I think I think everything's out of print. I don't think any of it's on IST. I don't think any of it's on Amazon or anything like that. You guys, if you guys are interested, you still want to read it, you can look. I mean, I seen it on eBay for fairly cheap. I think it's volume four. Is like the hardcover for volume four is like is pretty pricey, like a hundred dollars plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, read. I don't know if it's on any like digital stuff, like Comicsology or or whatever the case might be. But if you like crime and you haven't read this, you need to you need to satisfy that. You need to get that taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's still a ten out of ten book for me. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think, I think in the, in this day and age where we're not getting sixty issue runs, where we're getting kind of twenty, thirty issue runs and stuff like that, this this is a book that really stands out for me. This is a book that is special, and I still hold it absolutely near and dear to my heart. Um, and. I, yeah, it's it's just that good. Honestly, it's that good. And the thing is that this is sixty issues. It didn't feel like sixty issues. Oh no, it goes fast. It's a fast read. It's a pretty good read. You know. Yeah, it definitely didn't feel like sixty issues. Mm-hmm. I've read comics where I'm trying to get through twenty issues of it. And I'm just like Jesus Christ, this is fucking terrible. I can't, yeah. the, the, I can't get through this. And this 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 just flies by, man. It, yeah, it, it, it's just amazing to show like this is like Jason Aaron's like first big book. Is it really? Like before, yeah, before he did this, he still had a day job. Like he was working at a warehouse or something like that. Yeah. And then this book happened right as his kid was born, so he was able to be like a stay-at-home dad. Mm. So this book gave him like that kind of like security and that comfort, and then it just went from there. Like this is the book that kind of just springboarded him, you know. So. Yeah. I think he's one of the best guys working in the industry today. I, lo- I love Jason Aaron stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Dude. When Jason Aaron hits, and I mean really hits, he knocks it out of the park. Again, he's always I- been one of my favorite writers over the last because of this series, really. Yeah, yeah, and he's like his, his Thor player. is fantastic. You know, I never read like his Punisher run. Uh, Southern Bastards. Um, what was the one that's about uh, Kane from Kane and Abel? Oh, I forgot what the name of that book was. Um, Badlands or something like that, or yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll go through some questions and stuff real quick. Uh, Cleveland Brown asked this a little while ago because um, we were talking about we don't think it, it could be published today, and he goes, uh, "Not even like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo crowdfunding." I think that could happen, but I think, that could happen. I think we meant more in terms of being released by like a, a major publisher. I could see maybe Image doing it. Um. Mm-hmm. But again, when's the last time we got like that hard edge of a book where it comes down to like a lot of like politically incorrect stuff? Like there's a lot of like racist stuff in here. A lot of like the N word get thrown gets thrown around a lot in here. Uh, abortion, uh, you know, uh, uh, gay sex. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of stuff in here that is just super super touchy today. I don't that. Unless it was like an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter, you know, it, it would probably have problems finding a home. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Uh, Lars, I think Southern Bastards would be equal to Scalped if the series could be finished. I wish. Is that a thing because of Jason, um, Jason yeah. Latour? Yeah, I think that's a thing because of Jason Latour, which I never really looked into too much of that and stuff like that. Um, I wish they would go back and finish that book because, God, I love Southern Bastards. Uh, I blame Lou for getting me to read this. Warned me it was gritty, and yes, it is. Brilliant writing and art. Take off the dust wrappers and look at the wraparound gloss illustrations. Yeah, the illustrations on these are um, were the like French editions of they're like great. the paperbacks or something like that. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're, they're right. They're they're all super gorgeous. I read these digitally. I read the same editions. There's a lot of back matter stuff in those as well. There's a good amount of art. There's an afterwards and a forward in a few of them. There's a good amount of stuff there. Yeah. 
Uh, Cleveland Brown, did Jason Aaron talk about Scalped recently? I hope he does not go. I regret some of the things I wrote in Scalped, like some writers do. I don't know. That's the that we're talking about. There's a lot of stuff in here that, you know, would not, you know, would look really bad on him for doing today, probably. When was this published? When was 2007. this? 2007. 2007. Okay. So, been, like that, 15 years ago? Man, it's been that long. Wow. No. Yeah. Yeah. About 15 years ago. Man, it's been a long time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Axel Alonzo was the editor for Preacher, and he wouldn't publish that series or scalped at his current company, AWA Upshot. Has he said that? I guess. That's what an uh, NFL dude's saying. Yeah, I believe that. Oh, yeah. Preacher. You want to talk about a book that wouldn't get made today? It's uh, it, it, it's Preacher. Preacher would not get made today. I would love to do a reread of Preacher because it's been way, it's my favorite comic of all time. And it uh, it's been a long time since I've read it. We could put that on the list, dude, because I haven't I've I've never finished it. You never finished Preacher? I've never finished Preacher. Oh wow. I love the ending of Preacher. Yeah, I have the absolutes. Um I think I just one of those things where I was reading it and then I got caught up with doing something else and fell off of it kind of thing, you know? Let's put it on the list. I will be down to reread Preacher again. That's another book that flies by. Uh uh A Mar Martin again. Uh oh. Just reread recently. My advice is to buy the five hardcovers while they're still available. Do you two think, like me, that this will not be reprinted? Same for the Omnis of a hundred bullets. I don't think so. I don't think. Are, are, are the Omni bullets out of print? Let's take a look. Because uh, I'm going to be reading hundred bullets soon. Like that's gonna be my next my next readathon for me. It's gonna be hundred bullets. Everybody else wants to join it. Uh, let me take a look around. That's interesting. Is that'd be interesting if it was out of print. But yeah, so you don't think it, that this would ever get reprinted? You think? I don't. Just simply because I don't think the DC and Black Label is is in a place to reprint something like this right now. It doesn't seem like they are. It doesn't seem like they're focusing too much on their back catalog right now. If it's not Sandman, it doesn't seem like they give a shit about most of their Vertigo stuff, which is unfortunate. Because you think about all the prestige stuff that was that was put out by Vertigo, and it doesn't seem like they care too much, you know? Sucks. Uh, so 100 Bullets is, is not on in stock, but it is on Amazon. Okay, but I don't think I don't think they would. Re I was surprised that Hundred Bullets even got a reprint or even an omnibus. Like all that vertical stuff has just kind of disappeared. It feels like, other than like the the, the major yeah. things like Preacher and stuff like that that keeps coming out. That's like a forever kind of thing. Yeah, it kind of does. Um, Daniel, that's a top five book for me. Darkest realistic book I've ever read. Lars, uh, suddenly got the need to continue reading Scalp. Yeah, I hope you do, Lars. I hope you all enjoy it. Ah, oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, the goddamned. The goddamned. Yeah, that's the Cain and Abel book. Yeah. Rosie, you read Scalped uh, digitally during COVID lockdown. Loved it. If this ever gets a new deluxe release, I would get it day one. Uh, if there's a HBO adaptation of Scalped, who would be your dream casting? Famous Native American actors or the following? Dan Dan <laughs> Danny Trejo, <laughs> Jason Mimosa, Lou Diamond Phillips, and Taylor L L L <laughs> Well, we almost did get a Scalped TV series. It was going to yeah, be the worst casting ever, dude. That's That casting sucked ass. Right All of it. Even that guy that played Red Crow, none of it made sense. Yeah. I, as the guy that played Red Crow, I'm like, yeah, it could have worked. You know, he's on Yellowstone now, and he's he's a really good actor. But the rest of that casting, I'm like, mm, this isn't that good. The Carol they picked, I'm like, that is not whorish enough to be Carol. I'm sorry. Or hot enough. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but, I, I, you know. Oh, no, he was a dog. So, some of those characters that they chose to play – some of the actors they chose to play the characters, I'm like, that doesn't look anything like Shunka. That doesn't really give me Dashiell Bad Horse vibes. That 
and it, not on, not only that, it was WGN, which is really interesting because yeah. I'm like, WGN, that's the that's the channel that shows like the 700 Club after two o'clock. Yeah, on- it's, a, it's a Chicago like 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 affiliate, and all that they are now is like a news station. Yeah, it was a really weird choice. I, I, in a way, it might be a blessing because who knows in a few years, especially now with uh, James Gunn being the head of you know DC and stuff like that, I kind of wonder if this would fall into that category. Maybe we could get a really badass scalp series on HBO. You know, we've got Yellowstone now. Yellowstone's yeah. the most popular show. I believe it's the most popular show right now in, in the United States. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. I think they could do it. You know, it just, again, you just have to have, you just got to have, nobody has the balls to do it, I think. I don't think anybody has the balls to do it and keep it as gritty as it is. Yeah. Like a lot of the actors on like on Res Dogs, like there's that main the main female actor on that. Oh, she'd be a great Carol. I would like to see her smoking crack all naked. Sure. <laughs> oh no, that was oh. meth or heroin. Does he remember, remember the? Was it Dino? Well, Dino had like a brother who was like retarded. Yeah, he did. And yeah. His mom. There's that one scene where his mom is like in some like abandoned, just gutted out car, like smoking meth. She's like. This ain't crack. This is <laughs> this ain't crack. This is good old meth. It's healthier. It's oh no, it was the other way. It was the other way around. Oh. Like, this ain't meth because meth is all full of chemicals. This is good, healthy it's crack. crack. <laughs> yeah, that that was a moment where I was like, oh god, this is borderline, just a little bit too much, or it, it, it was borderline comedic. I wasn't sure if it was yeah. supposed to be taken as a serious moment or not, but it was so over the top. That it was comedic for me, where I started laughing. Where it's not enough that she's smoking crack; she's also smoking crack in the back of a car while being pregnant, and yeah. she also doesn't seem like the brightest light bulb in the world either. And I'm just like, oh god, yeah, it's rough. Uh, let me see here. Where does this rank for you guys in terms of the best vertical series of all time? I gotta look up some of the vertical titles. I don't know, man. Vertigo, Vertigo has some. Vertigo is a banger, dude. Like they, it's oh, such a everything came out was amazing from Vertigo for the most part. And this is nothing against this book because I think this book is incredible. But you know, you look at the catalog of Vertigo stuff, and it's. It's, it's a stacked. lot of competition, man. It's fucking stacked, son. You know, you've got, just off the top of my head, Sandman, Preacher, Why the Last Man, Fables, um, Unwritten. Transmetropolitan. Transmetropolitan, Unwritten, 100 Bullets. Um, fuck, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing is Vertigo. Let me see. Oh, that's, yeah. That's, that's the first Vertigo, run. yeah. That's a legendary run. Uh yeah, so we got hundred bullets. That's a banger. Like I'm reading that soon. I, I really want to go through that oh. again. Um, American Vampire, great stuff. Um, Animal Man, legendary run. Astral City, yep, still going today, and it's really good apparently. Um. Trying to see. This is all alphabetical. It's gonna be Day amazing. Tripper. Oh, yeah, that's a book that I can't read it anymore. DMZ. I've never read it, but a lot of people liked it. I know it has like its controversials. Doom Patrol. Fables. Uh, what is a haunted tank series? Hellblazer, Hellblazer, yep. That's like three hundred issues, though. That's yeah, it's a lot. The Invisibles, I Zombie, Joe, the motherfucking barbarian. Love that book. That nobody really has given enough credit to. I feel. Losers, 
Loveless, Lucifer, Madam Xanadu. Preacher. Yeah, it's going to be hard to rank it, man. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I couldn't. Honestly, top 12, I couldn't. maybe? Top 10. He's, it's in my yeah. top 10. Yeah. It's uh, number one would be for me, Alan Moore Swamp Thing. Because I love that run. I absolutely adore that, that book. The ball Jason Momoa could play Dash. <laughs> That's racial appropriation, though. You can't have a somebody not Indian play an Indian anymore, right? Uh, well, oh, unless they're I'm cosplaying. Pre- you get away with anything for cosplaying. So it would be Preacher, Alan Moore Swamp Thing, Sandman? Um... Top five vertigo. Uh, la, la, la. Fables would probably be in there as well. And transmit. But I could switch fables and transmit in that position depending on the day for me. No, I don't disagree. Um, there's a lot though, dude. Like even stuff that's kind of newer, like uh, Sheriff of Babylon. That's not top 10 though. Um, yeah, so transmit. I know Transmit. Transmit's my one, my favorite book of all time, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's top ten, you know. Like lower top ten, like mm-hmm. maybe within like you know seven or eight. Preacher. Ooh. Such a good book. Where can we get some of the books that we talked about just now, Gabe? Okay. All right, so yeah, the books we can get. Let me get this going again. Give me a second. Let me end the screen share. There we go. There it is. Once again, everybody, this awesome show is sponsored by InStockTrades.com. The number one spot, again, don't spend full-on cover price, $150 for your omnibuses. Go to InStockTrades.com on Tuesday. Make sure you stop here on Monday so we can show you what's coming out on Tuesday. On Tuesday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, hit up InStockTrades for all the best deals for the week. Up to 50% off, um, best customer service, amazing packaging, free shipping on orders in the U.S. of $50 or more. Uh, last Monday of the month, we give away a $50 gift card to one lucky viewer live on the show for In Stock Trades. Go there, have a good time, get your books for cheap at InStockTrades.com. Boom. All right, all right. Sandman Mystery Theater does not get enough love, sadly. I've never read it. That's the salmon theater. That's the old salmon with the gas mask and like the the gas gun. Mm. Yeah, I don't know anything other than that. I've never read any salmon theater. It's a jazz book. It's probably a jazz book. Probably. All right, Lou. Uh, that's it, everybody. Thanks again for showing up. I hope everybody has a great time. I hope you guys check out Scalped if you haven't checked it out before. Um, Lou, where can everybody find you at? You can find me at Threads, El Carrero 89 That's really the only social media that I keep up with at this point. You guys can hit me up on Instagram, uh, Gabe Loves 90s Comics. So hit me up there. <sighs> All right, everybody. Well, we're going to take off. Uh, man, this is a great, solid show. I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Good and night, I hope everybody. nobody uh, smokes a bunch of crazy crack or gets involved with crazy Indians. <laughs> One sixteenth Kickapoo. <laughs>